Before we jump in, please be aware that this episode contains a discussion around feminicide with mentions of sexual assault and domestic abuse. We advise listener discretion. Welcome to Alter Everything, a podcast about data science and analytics culture. In this episode, we're going to talk about feminicide as a global issue with a focus on violence against women in Mexico. In order to bring awareness and fight this issue, data is needed. And our two guests today, Monica Cisneros and Kate Butcher, are working with activists and other Alteryx associates to help digitize and analyze the data with a goal of bringing about real change. Alteryx will be hosting a webinar on March 8th, 2022, that will be a deeper dive into this project. And if you can't make it on March 8th, the webinar and the resources mentioned in this episode will be on demand in our show notes. While this is a heavy topic, it's so important to bring awareness to this issue. Let's get started. My name is Monica Cisneros. I am Product Marketing Manager for Data Science and Machine Learning here at Alteryx. A few fun facts about me is that I have two dogs. They are 10 and 11 years old, a Basset Hound and a a Chihuahua mix. I love them so much. I love playing racquetball. I love painting. Anytime, I'm always up for happy hour. So those are the things I am very, very passionate about. And then obviously what we're going to talk about today, this podcast, this new project I'm super passionate about. So really excited to to be and have the opportunity to speak about this topic today. Awesome. So my name is Kate Butcher. I'm a senior manager of product management here at Altrix, also focused on the machine learning and advanced analytics product portfolios. So to me, this is a a really exciting conversation. As much as I'm a, a data nerd in and of itself, I really enjoy the storytelling that comes with data and that is enabled by data. So really looking forward to this. Awesome. So both Kate and I are actually quite new at Alteryx. I started a few months ago and I just love how passionate Kate is about, you know, technology topics and, you know, starting this mini series about talking about, you know, nerdy things, talk about data, let's talk about how data transforms not only businesses, but also the world is a topic I'm super passionate about and that Kate, you know, had the same type of, you know, passionate look into the world. So I was like, hey, let's let's just let's just do this. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think when Monica shared this first topic in particular, which we'll introduce in a moment, there were a lot of similarities to different areas of my background that I've also partaken in. I guess to to go into what this topic is, we will be discussing um, feminicide in Mexico in particular. Monica, would you like to give a a quick introduction here and we can share a little bit about, you know, why this topic resonates with each of us? Yeah, absolutely. So this topic came about, I have always wanted to do a program for International Women's Day. I consider myself a feminist and I really love to see how data transforms the world. And one of those topics is specifically how data helps feminist movements go forward, right? And this one in particular, this is this is a, a hard topic to talk about just in general because of the nature of of the topic, right? So feminicide is a hate crime term, broadly defined as the intentional killing of women or girls because they're female. So this is a big problem that is not only happening in New Mexico, it's a global problem. There is a huge issue of violence against women globally here in the U.S. There's a big issue on that, all Latin America, you know, everywhere that this is a, a an issue that we all have to deal with because we are living in a society where inherently women are not seen as equal. So, Particularly, the topic I want to talk about within Mexico is something that is very personal to my experience. So I was born in El Paso, Texas, but I grew up in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. So, you know, I went to school there, had friends there, my family was there. And when recently is something that you kind of look back and you realize like, oh, man, 
my my childhood was very different than a lot of you know my friends or you know my significant other they grew up in in Seattle and my childhood in Juarez was very different right we in front of my house we had a park and I was never really allowed to play at the park without you know 20 like basically I had to had parental supervision the whole entire time and even then my mom was still nervous about letting my brother and I you know play in the park even though it was literally just across the street and you know this thing that we're talking about is not to create a stereotype actually it's quite the opposite right where we're trying to bring in to light and highlight a problem that it's happening but making sure that we're dismantling all these stereotypes that are happening of, you know, Mexico is quote, quote unquote, a dangerous place. That's not the case. We're trying to make sure that the audience understands that all the things that are happening there are due to a big web of influences that are happening, right? So it, it is a big issue. Feminicide is a big issue in Ciudad Juarez. But it is also an issue around the world and violence against women is everywhere. Yeah, thanks for sharing a little bit about that story and your story, Monica. I appreciate that. You know, you started with that definition of feminicide, right, as really being the the killing of females and, and girls because of their gender, right? In doing a little bit of research around this topic, one of the pieces that was was really fascinating for me to learn about in particular was actually the difference even bet- between the two words that you'll see come up around femicide versus feminicide, where, you know, femicide is kind of that that initial definition, whereas that initial definition being referred to as, again, the killing of females by or, or girls by males because they are female, right? Whereas I think this word feminicide goes one step deeper, as I understand it too, and feminicide starts to bring in the implication of the state or the government's complicity in maintaining this violence against women, right? But how how is this, where did this stem from, right? What are the historical and cultural pieces that have contributed to this? And how does a government or state agency really help to perpetuate that? Thank you so much for bringing that up. And so just to be very clear with the audience, I am very new to this topic. I am in no kind of sense an expert or anything like that. My expertise is, you know, the data science and machine learning marketing <laughs> and a little bit of neuroscience. We'll talk about that later. But um, with with this, this is, again, it's, it's from a personal experience. This is where I'm coming from. And I am still learning a lot of the things that are happening. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper onto you know, who we're partnering with and what we're doing later. But let, let's just start with your question, right? Which is femicide versus feminicide. And that is something I didn't know uh, at the beginning. I was like, oh, I guess it's just the English translation. It's like no big deal. But as you're pointing out is it takes that cultural part of it when you are, are the NI extra into feminicide. So in Mexico, as far as I learn, it is a complex set of issues, right? We have impunity from the government. So what happens with it, what is impunity is basically that there are no consequences to any of these actions. An example of this is with Maricela Escobedo. It is the mom of Ruby Escobedo. Ruby Escobedo was killed by her partner and became a very, very loud activist in the community to try to get justice to her daughter and long story short nothing happened to the guy he went out free and on top of that because Maricela was being such a avid advocate for her daughter and other women that have gotten killed and basically their assailants have no consequences to them she actually was killed too so you know it it is a very, very sad story that you see impunity and the government and the community being implicit in not only the killing of of Ruby, but also of Maricela, the mom, right? So, So it's a huge issue that it stems from a ton of places. Now, you also touch upon part of the cultural aspect of it. 
So there is the patriarchy, which is a, a general concept in, around the world where men are seen as the leaders of a cultural society. But there is a subset of that called machismo. Uh, machismo originally was associated with the ideal societal role of men that were expected to play in their communities, more particularly in Iberian language-speaking societies like Spain and Portugal, where this is basically associated of the role of the man, right? You have to, you know, protect the women, you have to, you know, have a certain way about speaking, and it, it is very much so evolved into this, this like very toxic masculinity part of it that has gone into you know colonial places like for example Mexico that was colonized by the Spanish in um, you know centuries ago and now machismo has been evolved and being part of not only Mexico but a lot of Latin America and that is part of the culture so machismo is strong strongly and consistently associated with dominance aggression and exhibition so you know this thing about you know oh shut up woman that's that's one side of machismo and the other one side of machismo is something like my grandpa telling me hey you cannot go to college alone because you're unmarried you know so it's it's those two sides of like one of them is protecting women while also making them less that we are less independent or less autonomous of what we can do. And then the other one goes all the way to aggression and uh, subservience. So that is also part part of the culture. I think part of that is, again, going back to, to history of how females are uh, perceived in society and, and the relationships that they have to their, their male counterparts. And I, I think, you know, taking a step back, education and economic, socioeconomic status play such a role here. And I think it's important for us to really hone in on that, right, of how our education systems and how they, you know, differ from country to country, but how they often perpetuate these problems, right? And it, it creates a separation where um, a lot of these gendered stereotypes become learned, right? And become ingrained in, in culture and it, it passes down from generation to generation. I think, you know, education is of course a, a great opportunity for us as societies, but it also, it again, it perpetuates some of these these classist problems that we're up against. And so I might might throw a question question back to you, Monica, of, of trying to understand, you know, what are some of the ways that education can help to help to change the conversation here? And what are some of the, you know, movements that you see alongside education that are helping to drive feminicide and other associated issues to the the top of conversations? as it relates to, to women's empowerment. Yeah, so that's part of the issue, right? A lot of people don't know that this is going on. Or, you know, even even in like my own hometown, which is severely affected by this, a lot of people don't think it's real, don't think it exists, right? They think it's, you know, isolated incidents or it's like not as or as severe as he's talking about or there's also a lot of victim blaming and that is part of a huge part of the issue right so basically what there are a ton of people working on this not only in Ciudad Juarez but across the globe right we have people especially in Latin America we have in Colombia and Argentina here in the U.S. there are a ton of activists that are working on femicide feminicide and also violence against women type of work right where they're using data in order to do some analysis understand the issue better and be able to collaborate with people there are quite a lot of issues when it comes to sharing this information so number one we have a data issue right let's even start even before that right people are scared to come to the police and 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 bring a report out first of all that's that's first issue and it's like not only in feminicide but then also you know sexual assault other types of 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 violence against women uh, domestic abuse as well i mean a lot of women are scared to even report the 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 assault number two even if they do there's nothing that 
happens afterwards, right? It's all about the impunity. Number three, when it happens and either there is or there's not a consequence to that report, when we get to news stations or newspapers, there's a lot of issues on how that's being talked about, right? Some news news corporations tend to sensationalize the the event. They're basically trying to be to have viewership and put the violence at the first and have like a very graphic image just to sell more papers. There's a lot of victim blaming, not only in the community, but also within the news. And then also there's victim erasure. So, you know, victims are being stripped out of, out of their names, their identities, everything. One of them can be for protection. Uh, that is uh, one way for victim erasure that is accepted. But then there's another one where they are only focused on the crime in order to sell more but not for the benefit of the victim. And a lot of the times when this is happening, women tend to disappear. So it's like not even about finding the body already. It's just like, hey, this woman has disappeared. We need help finding her. And the fact that they don't put the name, they just put the story just to sell, that is part of that victim erasure that is happening within some newspapers, right? Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I, I think that's spot on. I think you've you really highlighted the fact that from the very beginning of this problem, the the ability for, for women to speak out and speak up is is often the, the largest challenge. And that trickles down into our ability to understand the problem because it's not being reported correctly. I think that, you know, there's a really strong ability that starts to come a a strong story that we start to be able to create as we get more data about this, as we get more stories about this, as these taboo topics become more spoken about, right, more accepted to speak about. And, you know, I think some of the, the statistics that I've seen in general are really helpful for trying to break down that barrier, right? You know, I think there's the the current statistic is that more than one in three women will be in an abusive relationship in their lifetime. Just taking a step back to pause on that, that's, that is a huge number. That is a huge number. And it's having that data, having those statistics that start to enable and empower us to see that we're not alone in this, right? And, and that's, that's powerful, tr- really trying to understand that, understand that this is not an other issue, that this is something that is affecting women, you know, throughout the world today. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many people out there, so many great activists working against violence against uh, women, right? Like my own mother-in-law, she volunteers and she's there to, you know, help out women who suffer domestic abuse in North Carolina and in Boston, right? But for this particular topic for feminicide, I do want to call out a few activists that are working on this precisely. There's a data and feminism lab at MIT that is doing an amazing amazing work and they're mapping and creating understanding what the features are are happening and what influences feminicide in other regions there is maria salguedo actually i had the privilege of talking with her and she's going to be one of the advisors in our work and she was named one of uh, forbes mexico's most influential women in 2019 and 2020 and she's working on feminicidios in Me- mexico which is a a crowdsource map of looking at all the women disappeared and found dead in Mexico. Then there's also Sonia Madrigal, who is working on aggregation of areas. She's working on a collaborative map of not only Mexico, but also in all of uh, the Americas. And then there's Yvonne Ramirez, who worked on the project where it's, it's in you know part of the area that we're working on in Ciudad Juarez. So awesome. with with that, like, do you want to transition into what we're doing today at, at Alteryx to help out? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned a lot of the great resources that those activists are each leveraging to tell these stories and to bring awareness to the area. You mentioned crowdsource maps and leveraging data. Tell me more about how Alteryx can help support, you know, this initiative from a data perspective. 
Yeah. So again, I'm super passionate about this. So I started reaching out on Twitter to Maria Salguedo and I ended up talking with Dr. Uh, Silvia Fernandez. Maria Salguedo, I had an awesome conversation with her, but she's doing an amazing work already working with the Department of Justice of the state of Sonora actually, you know, using her map and her and her analysis to help the Justice Department bring, you know, justice to those women. Uh, so she's a little busy. <laughs> so I'm focusing the work with Dr. Fernandez, who is an associate professor at Washington University Pullman. And, you know, I would, we would just started talking on Twitter and she was like, hey, what, like, let's just collaborate, right? And I, I told her, you know, I work for Alteryx. So, hey, let, let's bring that magic uh, into something that can change the world and, and influence uh, people's lives, right? So I started talking with Dr. Fernandez uh, to collaborate. And I'll just start with a little bit of background as to what this project is about. This project is called Archiving Feminicide, From Data to Narrative. And this project started with Esther Chavez Cano. Esther Chavez Cano worked at Diario de Juarez, which is a famous publication in my hometown, and eventually gained a position in the executive board of the newspaper. This was back in the 80s. In 1992, she started an activist group called Ocho de Marzo, where they protested strict abortion rules from the government. In 1993, Chavez began keeping track of the findings of murdered women ar around Juarez. And with her group of Ocho de Marzo, she began, she began to call the government agencies to do a better job at solving those outstanding murder cases and bring the people to justice. In 1996, she formed a coalition of NGOs to unite to work for the prosecution and prevention of crimes against women. So again, not only about feminicide, but also domestic violence, about sexual assault, etc. And four years later, um, after 1996, they were able to finally make the, the police force to create a special unit to investigate sex crimes in, the, in Juarez. 1996, she created Casa Amiga. Casa Amiga is the first shelter of the city for women that are experiencing physical and sexual abuse. Uh, unfortunately, um, Esther uh, Chavez Cano died in 2009 of, of cancer. You know, I, I was talking about that in 1983, she started collecting findings and trackings about the women found killed in Juarez, right? So the University of New Mexico, NMSU, they have a collection of the newspaper clippings that she got and they have them in boxes like they're, they're just like in the library they're in boxes all of these like news clippings and in recent years NMSU has a group of people working and scanning and classifying those news newspaper clippings specifically with Dr. Cynthia Bejarano uh, who is a professor at NMSU she's leading the effort in here and now she's collaborating with other academics like for example Dr. Julia uh, Monarres and with Dr. Luis Cervera from Colegio Chihuahua and Colegio de Frontera Norte and also other students from NMSU working trying to classify all this information uh, making that in PDFs and making it digital. So Silvia Fernandez has already worked on other activist projects. Previously, she was working in Torna Par Separados, which is another data narrative project with Columbia University, where she was looking at detention camps in the U.S. during the Obama and Trump administration and basically track the money. Where is this privatized, the, the privatized industrial complex um, coming from and giving money to detention camps and it's amazing if you have a chance you should check it out check out her map turn torn apart separados and now she's she's working with dr bejarano to create this archiving feminicide project right so we were talking about the issues that are happening and actually this happened to us this week when we were talking and, and looking at the data basically you know first of all there are newspapers clippings not all of them are digitized 
A. B, sometimes that digitization of the assets are not great in quality. So we know, we need to make sure that all of them are rescanned and make sure that they are in high quality. And then number three, which is what happened to us <laughs> last week, was that the ones that were digitized, the um, the archivist at the university, they were doing something to the website and then it just disappeared. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like if, if this is happening to us last week, I mean, it definitely happens to other people that are looking at, you know, this type of work when, you know... It, it, it happens, right? It's, it's part of the issue that the data is not readily accessible. So when when I was talking to, Sil, to to Dr. Fernandez on how we're going to work together, I was like, hey, here at Alteryx, we have amazing tools. Uh, we have Intelligence Suite, which has optical character recognition where we can pull up information from PDFs. We can read them and we can analyze data in unstructured data. So pull up the text, do text mining and text analytics on it. I think that you know, partnering up with you on the team, we're able to, you know, take you to the next level, make this uh, a lot easier for you, you know, to, to help out on this. And then, of course, I was like, as a marketing person, hey, let's just put a ton of like awareness into the issue as well on top of that. So, you know, that's why we're doing the podcast too. So awesome. when when I pitched this internally at Alteryx, I was so gladly surprised of how many people within our Alteryx community internally, the employees, they were willing to help. Like, hey, you know, like I have, I, I am a data scientist. I am a data engineer. I am, you know, the one person who's like, I'm great at, you know, project management. How can we help you? And that just like warmed my heart so much. After the kickoff call that we had, I called my mom and I was like, I started crying and I was like, mom, I'm finally doing something for my community with what I'm doing. And so, you know, the whole neuroscience thing apart, I, I was on my way for a PhD in neuroscience in 2017. And I decided not to go at the end of the day because I needed something that allowed me to have a lot more personal or s the social interactions, right? I was in the lab basically 24 seven alone in the animal facility. And I, I needed a little bit more of, of that social interaction. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get a, a job. I ended up in a job in tech 2017. And I was very, you know, like my dream kind of died there. I was like, okay, whatever. I'll, I'll just, I, I won't be a scientist, but you know, at least I'm still in STEM. Let's, let's see what happens there. And then when I called my mom, I was like, well, this is the reason, you know, it's like, I have the privilege of working with such amazing people that are in the top of the field, amazing data scientists, amazing technologists, and they're willing to give their time and effort and their expertise to help out my community and having that privilege of making it happen. It means the world to me. So sorry, I'm like crying a little again. <laughs> Wow. No, I think that, I mean, that's what this is all about, right? How do we, what are, what are the stories behind this data? And I think the story of the community coming together to make this happen is just the, the epitome of what Alteryx stands for and is also just truly so wonderful to see everyone coming together for this cause across different communities, right? The universities plus Alteryx partnership. I think, you know, one of the things that's so important here is the storytelling that this enables, right? When you look at just the data, you're talking about those boxes of, you know, boxes of articles, boxes of newspaper clippings. And, you know, how great is it that we can be a part of this, take that information and start to put that story together, right? Start to grab value out of that in a way that, you know, didn't used to be that easy to do. I think, you know, when, when folks talk about machine learning, when folks talk about OCR, optical character recognition, for, for those don't, that don't know that acronym, you know, it's, it's easy to think about just the 
the, the technology behind it and how overwhelming that can be, right? When you just talk about the, the analytics portion of it, but being able to take a step back and really understand the, the value that comes from these stories, the opportunities that this enables across so many different industries, right? This is not just, you know, uh, I don't know, being able to contribute towards research, being able to contribute towards, you know, a feminist movement with this, being able to empower activists with this. You know, I think at the end of the day, our, our hope is that this and our intention really behind this project is that this information can be leveraged to bring to to, to lobbyists, to, to bring to the government, right? To make change that needs to happen. Data is power, right? Data is power for us. It allows us to break down those barriers and really see the impact of them. And it gives us the, the framework to have those conversations, to normalize those conversations. And I, I, I'm just so excited to be a part of this project and to, to be able to, you know, move one step in the right direction on this front. It, it has been an incredible experience so far, just working with Dr. Fernandez. I'm really excited to work with Dr. Bejarano as well, with their very powerful, influential activists that are, like you said, Kate, it's, it, data is power. And, you know, hopefully we can get to a place where this work can be replicated in other places, right? We're starting in Juarez, but again, it's a, a global problem. So how can we take what we learned here, those workflows, and make sure to repeat them somewhere else? Can we help other activists in other countries or other regions and for them to, you know, do whatever they need to do, uh, have that flexibility to make sure that it is custom to them, but the work is already there and they're able to leverage very, very easily and then go forward with that. Awesome. This is really exciting work for us to be a part of here at Altrix. Monica, can you share a little bit more about the upcoming webinar that we're hosting on March 8th and some of the work that folks can listen in to learn more? Yeah, absolutely. So we're we're taking all of those PDFs from the Esther Chavez Cano collection. We are going to use optical character recognition OCR to pull in the information, do some text mining. We're going to do some text analytics and understand what the trends are. You know, let's start with classification, just understanding, you know, where things are, what happened. What we want to get to eventually is have something like torn apart separados, where we're able to see, you know, where women were studying, where they were working, where they disappeared, if they were found, where they were found, and then triangulate, you know, basically their journey. And then also understand the influences that are happening as to, you know, what happened to them. Like, you know, was it somebody that they knew? Was it a stranger? Was it on the way from work to home? Or was it on the way from school to work? Like what, what happened, right? So then hopefully, you know, take that and share it widely with, with the community. I want to get to the point where we're able to crowdsource this work and be able to leverage the well i want to invite the altrix community to be part of it we aren't sure exactly how yet so a little bit of patience on that but i would really love for the altrix community to uh, be part of it the webinar you're going to hear directly from dr fernandez also from our corporate social responsibility director and you know just just hear her out. She's going to go a little bit more into detail into the project, the topic. I, I love to hear from her. She's such a knowledgeable person, again, coming from the humanities perspective. And the, the, the webinar is going to be great. March 8th, please everybody tune in. And if you don't get a chance to see it on March 8th, it's also going to be available on demand. And it's going to be available with subtitles in Spanish and Portuguese. Fingers crossed. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for, for tuning in. Monica, thanks for sharing your story and for making this connection to Altrix. We're excited to see where this project goes and looking forward to providing follow-ups throughout. Thanks for listening. For more on the resources and activists that Monica and Kate mentioned, as well as details for the Alteryx webinar on March 8th, check out our show notes at community.alteryx.com slash podcast. 
And by the way, if you were hoping for a more in-depth explanation of OCR, you're in luck. Here's Kate. So optical character recognition or OCR is the conversion method of converting images of, you know, typed or handwritten or printed text into machine encoded text, right? So with our Alteryx intelligence suite, we are able to scan these files into our systems and pull out what that content is so that that text is in a usable format. That usable format of text, we're then able to use a, a method called text mining to further categorize or identify what that content is, what, what that data is, right? Monica alluded to the fact that she would like to be able to triangulate the locations of where some of these incidents have happened. Details about, you know, the relationship of the abuser to the victim and so on. And so by using these text mining techniques, we'll be able to aggregate that information using a machine learning methodology to pull that out and pull those details to the forefront of our data collection process. That's going to give us insights that can better feed our stories and help to convey the, the bigger picture as we move forward with next steps on this project.